National Park Service Arrowhead logo, Glacier National Park, Glacier National Park Conservancy logo, a special thanks to our funding partners, Don Fish, Native America Speaks, to Medicine Campground, July 17th, 2019. A park ranger stands outside addressing an audience standing next to a man and a table of items. Welcome to the 35th year of the Native America Speaks program. Uh, this is the longest running National Park is a part of his Aboriginal homeland, and so he feels that it is his obligation to inform non natives of uh, the people's ways of life and philosophy and just help to understand and appreciate um, the Black food culture. And so I do want to respectfully acknowledge that we are on the Stapi Pugano land, the land of the Black food, um, as well as. This National Park is also on the land of the Palace of the Kootenai and Sage. So, can you please welcome Don Fish? The park ranger sits down uh. with the audience. Yeah, give her a really big hand because she pronounced uh, our name correct. <laughs> really good. I'm Scopy Pakani. Scopy, ah. Huh? Scopy means good in language. Okay, Nuxukwax, ah, nice to kill keep it done. Key arms cup of cany con on and a nice to an itchy to peak one. So I said, Hello, my relatives. My name is Kido Kipata. That's my real name, Kido Kipata. My English name is Don Fish, Donald Fish, or Mr. Fish. Oh. <laughs> And uh, I used to say, uh, my white man name is Don Fish. That sounds too racist, you know. So, <laughs> so I, I got it to English. It sounds a lot better that way. So I said, hello, my relatives, my language. And you under you'll understand why I say that. When I get through uh, talking here and giving information on uh, Jordan, like, is that your name again? Yeah, I got it. Like she said, I do this because of uh, <clears throat> what we always pray for is balance and harmony in this world, peace and harmony. So with understanding about our people, I really believe that <clears throat> helps out with relationships. And that's what this talk is about, is relationships, and uh, how we are in this world. So when I say okay and quacks, that's part of that, part of that programming I'm saying here. I brought some things here that uh, just for you to look at, to touch, smell. And this is part of my regalia. This here is uh, what we call a headdress. Don Fish picks up a traditional Blackfeet headdress Some people from the table. call it a roach. It's not the kind you smoke. These are eagle feathers. This in here is uh, porcupine hair. And this is a uh, deer tail, dyed deer tail. So I'll pass that around. You can just take a look at it while I'm talking. Don Fish hands the headdress to an audience member. Don Fish picks up a large feather from the table and then hands it to an audience member. And we, uh, the eagle, eagle is very sacred to us. And this was given to me a long time ago, it was beaded. And I use this in what we call a talking circle. I use this to pass around for people to look at. And this is called peyote stitching. Here, peyote stitching. Don Fish walks back to the table and picks up a coop stick. Don Fish hands the coop stick to an audience member to pass around. This in here was actually uh, back in uh, dog days. So do you know what the dog days, sir, is? Do you? Nope. 
Anybody here have an idea what the dog days are? As the presenter keeps talking, a member of the audience examines the coop stick before passing it to the next member in the audience. This was a coop, coop stick back in the dog days and even, <laughs> even in the horse days. Dog days are when, before the horse came here, the dogs were wolf dogs. They were domesticated to carry all of the people's worldly goods on a backpack or in a dog travois, poles that were put alongside the dog, and the dog could carry about 100 pounds back then. So that's what we call the dog days before the horse came here. And the dog days were thousands and thousands of years, way back to our creation stories to the beginning of time. So the horse days is, is probably only about, with some tribes, 200 years, some tribes 400 years. So Relatively short time when you take a look at our people who lived there back in the dog days. So <laughs> that's what I refer to. That coop stick was when a <clears throat> warrior would touch the enemy and get away. It was more honorable to touch the enemy than kill, that, kill your enemy. More honorable to do that. So what I'm going to be talking about refers a lot to our belief systems back in the dog days. And I'll be <coughs> going to modern times, how that fits in with our modern times, because our people have evolved, have adapted to our environment, from the dog days to the horse days to the automobile days. <laughs> modern times here, so we've adapted. And just to help you understand more about and appreciate more about our people's ways and beliefs, we're still here. We're still alive and well. We still practice our traditions. And in fact, <clears throat> when I was passing through Browning, I stopped off there. And there were beginnings of a uh, sun dance going on. I stopped off there to visit. And I'll probably be coming back up Friday to partake in that. So our, our traditions are still well and alive. There's also that Sundancer is related to Assiniboines, but we do have our Blackfeet traditional Sundance called Okan that's going on right now too, as I understand. So what the... <coughs> the presenter picks up a bundle of sage from the table. This here is uh, sage. It grows all over. This sage here, you can take it and just take the the leaves off and put it into a ball. This is what I call Plains Tribe or, or Northern Sage that we use. A lot of Mont Montana tribes use this. So I'm going to be talking about the smudging that goes on. This here is what I call California Sage. It's wrapped, wrapped with uh, twine. This and also. He puts the sage back on the table and picks up another herb, then hands the herbs to the audience for a closer inspection. <laughs> so one of the things. From the table of traditional Blackfeet items, he picks up a braid of sweet grass. Sweet grass. A lot of tribes use this, sweet grass. Our Blackfeet people, we really didn't use sage. Mainly we use sweet grass, sweet pine, and juniper for a smudging. Don Fish hands the sweet grass to an audience member. Don Fish continues to remove items from the table and hand them to the audience. This here is sweet pine. Just un unzip it and smell it. And this here is cedar. I, I harvest this, I go across the mountains to pick the cedar. You can find cedar in the cities grown by uh, your houses. It's the wrong kind of cedar that's used. This here is called osha root. It's also called uh, <clears throat> uh, 
bear root. I was in the sweat lodge one time and uh, if you uh, suck on suck on this, it really helps your throat, sore throat, it's, it's a medicine. I was in the sweat lodge and this, uh, I've had students come out with me once in a while to see what it's like. And this girl, she was sitting there and she was coughing. So I told her to take a little piece of this and suck on it. It'll really help you throw out, throw it out. And I had my cousin sitting right there by the door. And that girl asked me, well, what, what is that really? What, what is it? So I told her it's love medicine. <laughs> and my cousin that was sitting by the door, she hollered at her, spit it out, spit it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing her. <laughs> You're looking at these medicines. That's what we call them. This is what we use. This is what Creator gave us to help our, ourselves. Individually, or in a group setting, and in ceremonies, in our rituals. Because our belief, everybody believes in a higher power. So when I say grandfathers, what does grandfather mean to you? What do you think? What do you think that, what does that mean to you? He's my father's father. Your father's father. And my mother's father. Does grandfather mean anything sacred to you? In our ways, that is sacred what you're saying. But in our ways, you're, when I say opposite or either a sabbatical field. Those are the words we use to call our creator. Those are the names. Apostolic means maker of things. A sabbatical field means source of life. That's what we call our creator. Some say, nina not dus. Means father, son. And in our ways, when we, when we pray, we say grandfathers. Grandfathers to us means the spirits up above, these trees, these rocks, everything, the spiritual beings. When we say grandfathers, it has a different connotation for us when we use it in a spiritual way, when we say grandfathers. And what, like we say, let's say, what is your name? Ian, Ian, he just told me a little while ago. But Ian, let's say Ian is an elder. He's been with the, the tribe for a long time. And when we talk about Ian, we talk about his grandfathers. His grandfathers are his spiritual helpers, which could be a bear, which could be the rocks, a mouse, any kind of spiritual being, because he has went out and suffered went without food and water for four days or more to get these grandfathers, spiritual helpers. Because we're all simple people. We're just human beings. Our elders, our medicine people, they're just humans. Nothing really special about them except they have suffered for their grandfathers. So the Creator and our grandfather will work through this person here. That's a medicine person. That's what grandfathers are. So when we look at Creator, the unseen powers of Creator also are the grandfathers. Because we believe that Creator has made everything in this world. So that makes everything in this world sacred. Makes these trees sacred, these rocks. It makes you sacred because Creator is inside each every one of you. Inside the birds. Inside everything. So that makes everything sacred. So that by that being everything sacred, then that makes us all connected to everything. Because Creator is in everything. Creator is in me. So that makes us connected. So you can understand when I say, hello, my relatives. So when I say, hello, my relatives, I just don't just mean you. I mean these trees. I mean these rocks. So I'm saying, hello, my relatives. I prayed to all of the sacred beings that Creator has made to help me do what I need to do to help people understand about our ways. Because you believe in a higher power too. Hopefully you do. 
Most of you probably do believe in God or some higher power that's up there. So that's the main concept. When that baby is born, that's what that baby is being <coughs> taught about. Because when you're getting taught about creator, creator's creations, what comes with that is respect. Are you guys, did you guys get to look at those? Yeah. You just want to put them up here? A member of the audience walks up to restore the items to the table. The creator's creations. So that makes us also connected and dependent on creator's creations. When I first start getting into learning more about my ways, because my grandparents raised me. When I was about a year and a half old, they took me. My grandfather was probably 85 around there, 86, when he took me. My grandmother was in her 70s when she took me. So they were relatively old. They were very traditional. They didn't speak any English at all. Back then, when people got sick with uh, <clears throat> TB, tuberculosis, they were put in a sanitarium and kept there for from either six months to a year or more. And that's what they did with my mother. They put her in a sanitarium. So my grandparents took me and my sister, and because they were old and we were just, you know, really rug rats, my sister went with my grandparents my dad's grandparents. When I was born in 54, they just legalized alcohol on a reservation. So at that time, my dad was getting crazy. He couldn't take care of us. So the grandparents stepped in. My grandparents, my dad's name was Little Dog. So my sister took the name Little Dog and with my grandparents took the name Fish. Although we're both <coughs> siblings, same mother, same dad, we got separate, different names. So they start teaching me. When I was 10 years old, from eight to 10 years old, my grandfather started giving me more responsibilities in this way of life. So when he passed away, my teaching stopped in a way. My grandmother couldn't teach me because that wasn't her <laughs> it wasn't our traditional ways. So I was kind of lost there for a while. And on top of that, I was in the educational system. The educational system was, very, was a very uh, detriment to our ways of life. Because back then, when I was in school, we couldn't talk our language. We weren't taught anything about our people, our ways. Everybody talked English. The only one that talked Blackfeet was my grandparents and the older people. But everybody else talked Blackfeet. So I lost a lot of my language when I, one of my grandparents left. So I, you know, one of the things I started learning about as I was getting older, they, they made me go to, uh, what is it, uh, catechism, catechism school. And uh, at the end of catechism school, they give you statues and uh, pictures of uh, Jesus, God, and other things. And if you didn't know your prayers very well, you get one of those little uh, cloth spatulas, I think they call them. So that's what I got. I didn't get to learn my prayers good. But I learned a little bit about Catholicism. I learned about God. I learned about how we came into this world according to Catholicism. But I also learned about, we also are uh, part monkeys too, maybe. I learned about all the different ways growing up. So as I came back into these ways, I was taught about not to see the sun. 
creation stories of how Sun was creator himself. And I had a hard time with that. Because I learned in school what the sun was made of. And I was thinking that can't be creator. But I started praying about it, thinking about it. And it was awesome how simple our people were related to our beliefs, our creation stories. Because you think about it. Without the sun, what would this world be like without no sun? There'd be no life. No life without the sun. So I embraced that. I embraced the sun as being creator. We know what it's made of, but we got, we got, we got to think about it. There'd be no trees. And that really enhanced my belief of how we're dependent on everything in this world that Creator has made. We always think about that we're on top of the food chain. We're not. We're at the bottom. Because we need the plants. We need the animals to survive in this world. The animals, the plants, the birds, everything would probably be better off without us. They could survive without us. And you think about it, us as humans, we cannot survive without those things Creator gave, made, Creator gave us. So that concept, you know, I, <laughs> I was just amazed at it. Creator's Son. We have our, 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 our uh, story of how we came to be. We have a couple stories there. Every tribe has a story about how they came to be in this world. So you think about those two concepts there, belief in a higher power and how everything is connected and dependent with each other. And we get into personal worship, collective commitment. That baby is being taught Right in a womb, being prayed to, being talked to, being taught about creation itself and all the creations. It's learning about those things. That child from a baby until about eight or nine years old is allowed to be a child. Just run free, play, enjoy life. But as it gets older, it's going to be taught a little bit more and more about this world that it lives in. It's going to be taught about prayer. How when we go pick something, we're going to chop this tree down. We'll put an offering down in the ground. We'll pray to that tree. We'll tell us that tree to forgive, forgive me for taking your life. I'm taking your life because this is what I'm going to use you for. We're talking to that tree because we believe it's a spiritual being. When we go cut willows for a sweat, same thing. When I go harvest these sage, I pray. I tell that cedar, I tell that sage, I tell that sweet grass why I'm taking it. I'm going to use you because this is what Creator gave us to help us with our worship. So personal worship, collective commitment, that's what that baby is being taught in this world. One thing that happens with that there is that <clears throat> to help you understand more about relationship-wise, when that baby is being taught, I'm aware of this where it says that people, the people in the circle of life are native people that have sacred knowledge that have that sacred knowledge are responsible for teaching morals and ethics. So there's people that have that sacred knowledge are responsible for teaching morals and ethics. So who are those people? Do you, who do you think they are? The elders, the people with the most knowledge. 
The elders are people with most knowledge. What do you think? She's pretty close. Elders and people with mainly elders and old people, and I will teach teach that. Huh? <laughs> pretty correct. But remember what I'm saying: that baby is being taught. About eight years old, it's being taught about sacred traditions, giving more responsibilities. It's already being taught about creator, about connectedness, dependent. So that makes that child that's 10, 12 years old with the sacred knowledge. So from that child from down here all the way around, they're all knowledgeable in sacred traditions. They're all responsible about morals and ethics. In yellow sweatshirts, what are morals and ethics? Doing right from wrong. Doing right from wrong. And to add to that, in this life we live, it's not taught that very well. Relationships. Morals and ethics are about relationships. How are you in relationships, not only with your mom and dad, brothers and sisters, all the people that are in your life, but relationship with the environment. Think about that. We're not taught about that. To be in balance and harmony with relationship with everything that Creator has made. Morals and ethics, how are you? Do you go home and kick your dog, you know, if you had a tough day? Do you go tear a branch down? Do you throw trash out? What do you do? Morals and ethics, that's what it is, about relationship with what's all in this world that, that you live in. It goes right back to those concepts. Respect for what Creator has made. Because you know you are connected with everything. You know you are dependent on everything. So you got to have that, that love, the unconditional love for what Creator has made. Because Creator has an unconditional love for you. And that's what these medicines are about. Creator gave us these medicines here to use to help worship, because we believe when I light this. Don Fish picks up a smudging pot and shows it to the audience. That spiritual force is released to help me. I'm going to take this and like I'm going to wash up. He demonstrates the art of smudging in which he rubs his hands from his head to his feet in a washing motion. It's so like I'm going to wash up in it. I'm going to take that smoke and rub it down from head to foot. I'm going to take that smoke and rub it down because what I believe in, what I've been taught is that I'm cleansing myself. I'm purifying myself with that spiritual force, that spiritual energy that is released with that smoke. That's what I believe in. And my thoughts and my prayers. I have to be positive. I have to be focused. Because whatever I think, whatever I say is going to go with that smoke up to Creator and all the Holy Spirits up above and even here on Mother Earth. Because what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be prayerful. I'm going to be mindful. I'm going to be praying for people in my life that might be having a hard time, that might be sick. I'm going to be praying for guidance for the day. That I am, I have my morals and ethics throughout the day. I walk a good road. I treat everybody good that I can. But occasionally I get road rage, though. But I'm going to light this here in, uh, what's your mother, uh, baggies? I 
And what I'll do, I'll pass this around. <clears throat> it's up to you if you want to use it or not. And what I was taught is I don't, you know, we don't force our ways on anybody. It's just uh, individual choice how you do things. Don Fish puts sweet grass into the smudging pot, preparing it for a smudging ceremony. Hopefully it don't blow around too much. Don Fish lights the smudging pot, then hands it to other audience members to try. We're going to start from up here and just go, we can just go around, okay? If you want to use it, yep, if you can. If you don't, have, if you don't want to use it. The camera pans right, revealing the audience, going through the motions of smudging. You just pass it around and just kind of hold it through with each other, help each other out, hold it. <coughs> Don Fish walks back to the podium. Now this is what's called smudging. And we do this in the morning when we wake up. He picks up the braid of sweet grass that was used in the smudging ceremony. And our people with the black, black feet ways, what we do is we usually have a box, we have coals, and what we do is cut this or either we we'll break it off and put it on the coals and smudge up that way. That's the way our, our traditional black feet people did. And so what we've did is because of intertribalism, what we've done some of our people will just like this sweet grass here at the end and use it as a wand, just like that, while it's lit. We use it like that. That's how we use a sweet grass with a lot of uh, other tribes. But with traditional black feet, where we'll just cut it, put it on coals, and use that smudge that way. So our, our traditional Blackfeet ways are very, uh, very strict in a lot of ways how what we do, how we do things. And so I, uh, <coughs> my uncle, his name was Natusapi, and <coughs> he was traditional Blackfeet. He he had a bundle that he carried, a thunderpipe bundle. But also he was taught from a bush Cree from way up north. My grandma, her name was Minaki. She was full-blooded Cree. So we have a lot of relatives that are Cree and he learned from a bush Cree. So what he has done is <clears throat> he meshed Blackfeet and Cree ways together. 
Because when, when we sweat, we sweat with men and women. But in our uh, black feet ways, only men can sweat. Women don't sweat at all. So in our traditional black feet ways, that's, that's how we do it. But so he learned from a bush Cree. So we use a lot of Cree ways with what we do in ceremonies. One of the things is my, my uh, last name, Fish. My grandfather, his name was Mami. Mami means fish. That was his nickname, Mami. His real name was Makuya Tikan. Makuya means wolf, Tikan means robe. So his name was Wolf Robe. And if you, any of you know anything about the Dawes Act, maybe look it up, but during the Dawes Act, they lauded land out. They did what they call enrollment. It was part of the assimilation process. So what they did when they enrolled our people to give out these allotted lands, they gave you an English name. So they named my grandfather. A lot of our old people kept them, kept the names, but their names were passed down as last names. So my grandmother, she became Mary Jane Fish. So we actually, all of our lives, we've been using our grandfather's nickname as our last name. But a lot of our people now have used the name Wolf Robe. So that's one of the things there, is about our names. <coughs> so the smudging I told you about, a little bit of uh, insight of of how we believe in things, how we use things spiritually to help ourselves in ceremony. You know, we believe that <laughs> in this world, this modern world, there's so many things out there that are not good. Sometimes those things attach themselves to us, spiritual beings that are not good. If you like to go into bars, a lot of bad spirits in there. Those bad spirits will attach themselves to you. So we believe that's what the smudging does. It cleans you. It pushes everything that's negative on you, that's not good on you. It pushes it. Give it to Mother Earth. Mother Earth will take those things and do what they, whatever she does with them. That's the only thing way I can explain it. So that's part of that. And when we uh, <clears throat> smudge up our sacred objects, what happens there? We. A bond is established. A bond is established with the holy people again. That might be the elders, might be the medicine people, but also the holy beings up above. Because our belief system is what that was given to us to help us out in this way of life. I used to work in a hospital in Great Falls and I was asked, <clears throat> as a spiritual helper, spiritual guide, I'd go to the rooms in the morning and ask the uh, patients, what kind of spiritual care do you want? You want, you want some, you want to smudge up? Or do you want a pastor or a priest? And when they say either one, to me, that establishes their belief in the Creator again. But for us as Native, to me, what it does, it reconnects them to our ways. It reestablishes that belief, reestablishes that philosophy, how we worship Creator, what we look at, how this helps us out. And the patients, when they smudge up, and I'll pray over them, I'll, I'll sing a song over them. And when you're more positive, your healing happens faster. When you're negative, it doesn't happen very good. So that's why I used to like that job there, when I'd go there and sing for people and pray for people, do that. Donna Fish picks up a traditional Blackfeet drum. The drum is small <laughs> and made out of stretched animal hide. In our ceremonies, we have our musical instruments. This in here is a, what we call a hand drum. This in here is, a, I believe this in here is deer hide, because how thin it is. 
pass it around. You can just take a look at it, see how it's made. He then hands it into the audience and picks up another Blackfeet instrument, a shaker made out of buffalo hide. And I put some stuff around this so it won't uh, help it when we were going to sweat, it gets wet. This is made out of uh, buffalo hide. My son's the one that made that. My son's the one that gave that to me. Because <laughs> we're talking about Ian as being an elder. So our elders have that special knowledge, have that special relationship. We call them medicine people. Some of them might have that gift when they're young. Some of them might not. The ones that don't have that gift, they're, tra they're trained to be in that relationship with the spiritual beings. They know how to run ceremonies. They know the songs. They have developed a relationship with the plants, the animals, the birds, everything. They developed that relationship. And some say it's, it's, a, it's a secret. It's not really a secret. What it is, is a sacred knowledge. Not secret, no sacred knowledge. Because there was a man, they call him James Arthur Ray. Remember that name and look it up. He charged people $10,000 to be an Indian for a week. He did a, sun, he did a, a, a <clears throat> sweat lodge with some people. Some people were injured. Some people died in that sweat lodge. Because that man wasn't trained. Wasn't trained in our sacred ways. Didn't establish a relationship with the spiritual beings. He didn't understand what I'm talking to you about. It was all about this. And with that comes power, prestige. When we talk about our medicine people in our ways, we look at humbleness and humility. Because that person understands they work for creator, they work for the people. That is their job, that is their vocation. And that man didn't understand that. Did everybody get to use this? A member of the audience gives the smudging pot back to Don Fish. You didn't melt, did you? <laughs> did you want to use some? She might melt. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that concept there. As our trained practitioners, we call them medicine people. They have that special relationship with the spiritual beings. One of the things, how much time do I got? Five minutes? Humor. <laughs> Humor is one of our concepts. Humor is used a long time when the dog days to discipline children. You shamed them. There was no physical discipline back in the dog days because that child right from the baby was taught about the way of life, relationships. That if that child did something wrong, that child was teased by everybody. So that child didn't do it no more. But it was taught personal awareness, personal awareness. So humor is used a lot in our way of life. You understand yourself, if somebody's teasing you, you might get offended, but the thing is, in our ways, that's good. Because if I was quiet and didn't talk to you at all, you're in trouble. You know? So when we tease, we show somebody our affection that way. You know? But now humor is used in a lot, a lot of ways wrong, but we have used humor. The sacred clowns, the yokas, they help keep the balance and harmony in this world. Okay. Questions real quick. You only got two minutes. Uh, 
As an eagle. Yeah. Can you explain your concept of time? <laughs> concept of time. Back in the dog days, when the sun was coming up so high down there, moon, seasons, ceremonies. <laughs> we didn't say we start at one o'clock, we looked at the sun. And even nowadays, in modern times, you know, they'll say, well, we're going to start at five o'clock. But it might be six. It might be seven. It might be three. That just means to get there and whenever everything is, because there's a lot of preparation to ceremonies. When everything is, is just done right in our ceremonies, then we'll start. Some people will call that Indian time. Use it in a derogatory way, but it's not for us it's not. It just means that <laughs> when, it, when it, everything's gonna start is when everything's ready to start. Well, it's not gonna start at five after one. It <laughs> might be three o'clock. Anything else? What's the significance of your shirt? This helps keep me warm. <laughs> This is called a ribbon shirt. It's one of our adapt adaptations. You know, we uh, use buckskin stuff. So now we are uh, people that specialize in making these kind of shirts, ribbon shirts. We use them in ceremonies. We use them just to walk around and show off, or, or we can uh, <coughs> use them as, as part of our regalia to dance. The shirt that he is wearing is blue, containing several patterns and colors. How many people speak your language? It almost died out. There's a man named uh, <laughs> Daryl Robes Kip and this woman named uh, uh, Dorothy Stillsmoke, and they started an immersion school. This immersion school was where all they did was just talk Blackfeet. They learned English, but everything is, was in Blackfeet. When the kids grad graduated from that school and got into high school, <laughs> they excelled higher in testing. Because you're using both sides of the brain. Bilingual. And when you talk many languages, you use a lot of your brain. So there's a lot more fluent speakers now. There's some little tiny kids that talk way better than me. Know the language better than me. Don Fish walks out of view and retrieves his drum from the audience. He then walks back onto the screen carrying the drum. <clears throat> well, let me uh, grab that drum and I'll sing you a song before we quit. I'll put the drum up here if you want to look at it. You sure welcome to the rattle. <clears throat> because the sun dance is going on, that's what I'm going to sing you a song. All right? And what all of our songs are a form of prayer. They come from the spiritual beings. So while I'm singing a song, think about your family, think about people in your lives. Send them good thoughts. <laughs> okay, now, can you? I don't know which big star to sleep in dark, you know. I'm a spumokin on the two parts. Tomorrow, two can. Screen Fades to Black, Text on Screen, presented by Don Fish, Jordan Steele, filmed and edited by Hannah Schwalbe, Alexander Stilson, Glacier National Park Conservancy logo, 
a special thanks to our funding partners, National Park Service Arrowhead logo, Glacier National Park.